So we're going to start off by going through DJ Delta's character's backstory. And we'll give you a little bit of input. Uh, so the character's name is Lear, or Liar, uh, an Envoy Warforged. Very good type of Warforged. I was kind of disappointed with the Juggernaut. I'm not familiar with the College of Grammar specifically, or mechanically. But I don't know how relevant that'll be for a, a fluff backstory. Her skin is made out of silver and her eyes are rubies. She has a hollow area that can be revealed from her chest for her instrument name, of, of her name. Uh, and it can be played by her. On her back is a wind-up keyhole that's used to cast Song of Rest. Oh, okay. Like a music box. Like a soothing music box. I like that. Personality. I think she's better than most of the Warforged due to her, the purpose she was made for. As well as what she's made of. Refuse to use the wind-up key on her back. Oh, so she doesn't normally want to use the wind-up key. She was made by the wife of a lord to keep him entertained as he traveled to other cities and towns. At the time, she was treated a little more, or as little more than a walking music box. Once the Warforged got set free, she broke and tossed away the key to the music box function of herself. Sighing, she would start to play for some change. Play, play or pray? She would start to pray uh, for some change in a local tavern. Oh, no, okay, no, to play for it. I got it. not pray for change, but play, as in, yeah, perform. For some change in a local tavern, before starting to move away from the city... Trying to get as far away from the Lord that she once was a servant to. Um, so far that one day he may decide he wants the item that his wife brought a while ago. Okay, so I think I get the... Um, I, I think I get the, the gist of what the character is that you develop, DJ. What are you looking for in terms of improvement or motivation or things along those lines? Oh, you want Far Traveler from the uh, Sword Coast Adventures guide? Yeah, I mean, your background is a large part of your character. In fact, your background is really what helps make your character have character more than the race and the class does. So, yeah, um, what is it that we can do, DJ? Um, are you not confident about something? Or is there a connection between two points of this character that you're just having very... You're having a hard time uh, bridging that gap? You're not fully sure yet. Mostly how she interacts with the people of the new land she's traveling to and the like. Well, um... You like to brainstorm ideas of the character and the like. Well, how she reacts is going to be very... I mean, you're going to have to improvise that at the tabletop. Because you don't know what's going to be said or done. 
Um, and, and look, is she a unique thing to the world? Are there no other Warforged? Or is she common and people are like, oh, that's just another Warforged. Yeah, it's playing a song, but yeah, some of them do that, and so it's really casual. You have to think about her as a being inside the world. I mean, even in Eberron, where the Warforged were made and everyone knows about them, they still carry a little bit of, um, maybe a mystique. And not that people would be uncomfortable if they're like, oh, there's a Warforged. You know, whereas they might not say, oh, there's an elf, or oh, there's a dwarf, but oh, there's a Warforged. Victor, I'm always up for some nice strategy. If you want to reveal how to outsmart pickpockets, let me know. <laughs> they might be, DJ. That's going to be for you and your DM to sit down and decide. It sounds like with this character, especially being a bard, you are going to have a lot of opportunities to have some improvisation, right? You're going to be put in a, a lot of um, circumstances that for many people, that might be standard, but for her, it might be unique. Because look, it sounds like your character is only what? One or two years old? I mean, she's she's fully functional, but she's only been around in a very limited environment, in a very posh environment, for one or two years. And now she's actually getting out into the world and seeing that it could be scary, abusive, sad, full of sickness and death, where maybe she's never experienced that before. Um, she might be singled out everywhere she goes if she's the only one. And, you know, if she wants to be optimistic uh, through it all, then you'll have to roleplay that. Yeah, I mean, if, also, if you're made of precious metals and gems, you are, you're, probably, you're pretty clearly made by a noble or a great wizard or someone who has wealth and influence. You know, is your character going to try and get, uh, or not try to get kidnapped, but your character might uh, be kidnapped along the way or shanghaied or something for her, for her uh, precious uh, to be ransomed back or to be sold to the highest bidder as a curiosity. So yeah, you have a lot of fun stuff to consider. Warforged are nice. Because with most of the other races, they tend to be very long-lived. And not that not that Warforged can't be long-lived, but none of them ha have had the chance to. So there's a ton of Warforged that have only lived for a, a year, two, three years. I mean, you're probably venerable at 20 years, at 20 years old for being a Warforged and surviving that long. So you can roleplay through a very fresh set of eyes and questions. Oh, I see what you're saying, Victor. So they'll go for the obvious belt pouch. But if they get it, they'll only walk away with a handful of copper. Meanwhile, your gold is safe because they wouldn't think to dig deeper when there's an obvious uh, treasure bag on your hip. Well, she will have to polish it if it's made of silver. Because silver does tarnish. And can... Oop. Sorry, chip flew out. Consider that for your character too, DJ. Her skin will tarnish over time unless it's meticulously upkept.
Mm. That's true, Bobacus. Sorry, I'm, I'm social eating right now, apparently. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, that silver's gonna get, um... That Santa will tarnish over time. It can deteriorate. I mean, and also, what happens? Um, yeah, it's a mukbang stream, Delcorin, with hot salsa and chips. Um, what happens if she gets a cut on her face, right? And a big, and a big gouge of steel, or, uh, uh, silver is removed. She's gonna have an interesting scar, and how would she go about fixing that if she wanted to? Crunch, crunch, crunch. Also, hi, Santa. Huh. Hi, Santa. I've been a good boy. I hope you brought me presents. I'm almost finished with the salsa, and then we'll get the character under underway. Well, that's the interesting thing. Technically, healing magic works and healing potions works on Warforged. But, maybe for something like that, for the metal parts, it would have to be mending and not a, not a healing spell. Bobacus is also right. Otherwise, you could just use the mending cantrip to just generate steel or gold or whatever. All right, last little last little scoops. Yep. So DJ, um DJ Delta, just get into your character's head. Think about her. Think about her circumstances. Also think about the fact that she's only 3 years old. How much of the world does she actually know? Especially if she's been cloistered in the court of some lord who has access to entertainment, medicine, etc. When she goes out into the world, um, she's going to see that there's a lot of sickness, misery, death, and, and etc. So she's going to experience a lot of stuff while she's out. Ask yourself this too, DJ. What would what what would your character um, think of someone who has died? Exactly, Bobicus. Exactly. What does sickness, misery, and death mean to a warforged? <laughs> Maybe if you headbutt it, right, Santa? Or on a bright, sunny day, would it mean disadvantage on stealth checks because it's super reflective and shiny? Hmm, uh. pardon. Spicy stuff, you know? Makes you sniffly. So, DJ, as the pilot of this character, you have a lot of things that you need to do to internalize those questions. You also should sit down with your DM 
and discuss the world in which your character will be taking uh, a part in this adventure. Abacus, that's a very good question. Does your Warforged enjoy petting cats, or does she feel nothing? That's a good question. Babacus is putting in the work. All right, let's get things prepped here. Chapter 4, here's our character creation guide. Uh, ooh, we need a name for this character. Um... Let's see, he grew up as a brawler on the streets, so probably have some sort of like a tough fighter name that he's known uh, that he's known for. Um let's See, so he had this this to like he's he is this toad he, he is a street rat, right? He had this kind of pet mouse or pet rat. Maybe he's taken on some aspects of it. Um so maybe he's just known as a street rat. Oh, Bubonic. Yeah, we, uh, what, how did that go? What happened? DJ, you're very welcome. This is who we are and what we do. <clears throat> and yes, DJ, or will she be targeted a fair bit by bandits, dragons, and the like? There's a very iconic picture in Dungeons & Dragons that shows what happens when a statue, or in this case a statue-like being, has rubies for eyes. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Maybe a couple of you oldsters out there know what I'm talking about. When a statue has ruby eyes, something happens. Okay, you're gonna get it? Good, 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 good. Hey, Tin Cat, good to see you. So we have Street Rat. Barbarian 12. have a new character set up. We're going to reset our dice roller. And so we were able to help DJ with uh, with his Warforged character. And uh, it is time to... Uh... Oh, Bubonic says they're giving a $15 credit to everyone who pre-ordered through Amazon. Oh, because of a, a, a shipping delay? DJ says that might be where all, if not most, of the outside life of the noble she's seen... Oh, yeah, came from the Bardic Tales. So she might be faced with a lot of disappointment that everything isn't, you know, nobles courting young maidens and, you know, fantastic beasts that are just killed by, you know, heroes that just naturally exist. So I don't know if you'd want to, but I'd like to make a sheet for Ryren on the stream. Um, I don't mind doing that, Tin Cat. Uh, we can do that, though, in part three. Uh, because I do want to get through this other Eberron character first. And then uh, if you're fine with that... Uh, we can uh, we can tinker around with your tabaxi character in the next section. Will that work for you? Shipping delays. Amazon can't guarantee everyone who pre-ordered it will get it before tomorrow. Maybe uh, Bobakiss or uh, Bubonic one. Uh, can fill you in on the reference about, uh, in D&D, an iconic picture about a statue with ruby eyes. Oh, gotcha, bubonic one. Yeah, so Bubonic DJ is playing a silver-skinned uh, Warforged with ruby eyes. And I was warning uh, DJ Delta about what happens to statues with ruby eyes in Dungeons & Dragons. And there's a rather iconic picture that uh, demonstrates it. 
Okay, here we are, back to the random character generator. For all of you who are aboard now in part two, um, thank you for doing so. And you'll see how we ran how we uh, will generate a normal random character, but we're gonna add an Eberron template to him or her as well. <laughs> they get stolen by idiot thieves. <laughs> Let's roll a percentile, male or female, or multi-class on a 91 to 100. 47. Uh, that is another male character. Who is... We'll uh, roll a d10 and re-roll a 10. A 9. A tiefling. Ooh. So I think we're going to discover the aberrant... Uh, the aberrant uh, dragon mark here. Because I don't believe tieflings uh, have a house that naturally have a dragon mark. Now, something that we do is a little bit extra for the, the kind of half races of uh, half elf, half orc, and tieflings is uh, do they favor one half of their their origin or the other? As tieflings are kind of half human, half fiend, like demon or devil, and this could manifest uh, genetically in terms of how they look. Um, if a tiefling favors their human side, maybe they actually have pupils. Maybe their horns are shorter, or they have a more human skin tone in our in our own human ranges instead of like the violets and reds that tieflings normally get. Or let's say that we did roll that they favor their fiendish. Maybe instead of feet, they have hooves, or they have the um, uh, the backwards knees, or or their horns are just extravagant and large because they're they're. Um, they're genetically favoring their tiefling heritage. Or, if you don't want to take it that way, are they favoring linguistically or culturally one side or the other? So we're going to roll the d10 again and figure out on an odd. Uh, so he is favoring his human heritage more in some way or another. This is not intrinsic to, to the PHB. Um... This is something that we do maybe as a personality tiebreaker or to give you inspiration to, to better conceptualize the character at home as you may listen or watch the stream. Bubonic one, in anger the god whose statue it was who kills the engine adventurers. Moral of the story, don't steal from gods. Uh, DJ's going back into the forest. Uh, you roll a disadvantage, so six and six. So unfortunately, DJ, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the troll beats you. However... Um, as you roll the same number twice, some fun random magical event occurs. So DJ, I want you to type in exclamation point 1D100. And yeah, and DJ, Bubonic One just gave you a history of what I was referring to. Uh, it stops on 77. All right, so, DJs, you're going through the woods, and the troll pops out, and you're fighting it. Unfortunately, you are defeated in the battle. However, uh, this random magical effect occurs. You cast Polymorph on yourself. If you fail the saving throw, you turn into a sheep for the spell's duration. So, it's it seems like... Uh, <laughs> The troll, the, the troll popped out, and you're readying some uh, some magical defenses, and you accidentally turned yourself into a sheep, and the troll ate you. Uh, but don't worry, all is not lost. In fact, uh, DJ, uh, everyone gets one, uh, everyone gets one free, or something along those lines, anyway. Okay, so, um, DJ, whether you were a sheep or not, because it's a fun, it's a fun random magical effect, uh, you died, but don't worry, we can, we can drag you back to a place to get a resurrection-ish. We may not have a lot of money, and we may not necessarily know if this priest is reputable, but she says she can get the job done. So, uh, what I want you to do, DJ, is type in exclamation point res, please. R-E-Z-P-L-Z. -E As we drag your dead body, uh, sheep or not, uh, back from being defeated by the troll, or at least whatever's left of you, and we'll see if we can bring you back to life. 
Um, I, I mean, the save throw is kind of a fun cosmetic thing. If you want to say that you passed on a 15 and you stayed your, your natural shape to get eaten before you were a sheep, then yeah, that's fine. All right, DJ, you're dead, but not for long. When the spell ends, you arise to find yourself as a female half-orc wizard. So there you go, DJ. Um, you may not have gone in dead as a female half-orc wizard, but you, you came back to life as one, so how about that, right? Pocket punch, I had really bad luck and turned into a female undead half-orc. Well, so you, so you two might, uh... Um... So you two might have, uh, or yeah, barbarian, female undead barbarian. Yeah, you two might be able to compare notes and, you know, be like, well, things happen. <laughs> Alrighty, let's continue with the random character generation. We have a male tiefling who favors his human side. Uh, his alignment is going to be 5635. Uh, neutral, lawful neutral. Next up, we are going to generate this character at level 1D100. At level, alright, so at 99, we are making a 20th level character. Oh, your first D&D &D character. Well, DJ, if you want to share that story, you're welcome to do that too. Level 20. Nice and epic. Technically, the epic levels are like 17 through 20 in 5th edition, but at 20, you get that nice capstone ability. Now, let's determine if our male, uh, if our if our tiefling here is going to get any feats or just take all stat bumps. We're going to do that with a, a percentile roll. 15. We're going to go all stat bumps here. And now we're going to generate a 13 size, actually a 14 si Oh, no, 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 hang on. I don't believe tieflings have a uh, have a house, so this is going to be a 13-sided die. Otherwise, if this was a race that would naturally have the ability to get a dragon mark, we would include the special Eberron, um, the special Eberron uh, background of a, um, a scion of one of the houses. You carry the dragon mark and you're doing something on behalf of your house. Uh, let's see. Number seven, a hermit of some kind. Hermits have a D8. Uh, there are eight different origins of, a, of being a hermit. Let's find out here. All right, we're hermit number eight, whatever that means. I don't know what it is right now, and all we're doing is rolling placeholders, so don't worry about it. 2D8 for personality traits. We have a four and a three. And then 3D6 for the other portions of the background is going to give us four, six, and one. Now that we have this fleshed out, we have, a, we have a lot of placeholders, let's find out the class of this 20th level character. We have a big old golden D12 that we are going to be rolling. And let's find out what kind of an epic class we will be manufacturing tonight. And Santa's saying, let's pray to the old gods for a wizard. We want a standard class. Wizard, wizard, shouts Bubonic One. Norton the Knoll, I felt like I was interrupting the other night, so I decided to leave. If you were wondering, what would you have been interrupting, Norton? I actively encourage roleplay and conversation, even while we're, uh, while we're doing roleplay on the stream. You didn't have to leave. And... Eight. A ranger. We have an epic ranger. Now, a ranger has a, a big... has three different things that they can uh, pick up here. You can be a hunter or a beast master for your archetype, and we'll roll evens. Evens, we are a beast master ranger. One D two for revised ranger. What do you mean, Santa? If you're talking about the unearthed arcana one, I don't, I don't use unearthed arcana. Uh, Norton, a woo is around, but she, uh, she has company over. She has a friend over, and so she is in lurk mode right now. 
Now, Rangers, there's a couple other things that we can roll randomly for. Uh, we get a fighting style of some kind. And we're going to roll a D4 for that. Four. We are a two-weapon fighting Beastmaster Ranger. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it came out with an Unearthed Arcana Santa. I don't think that it, it, it has an official published... Um, I don't think it has an official published release. I could be wrong, but I, I think it's an Unearthed Arcana thing. Victor, your ranger's a duelist? Uh, no. Uh, not over gnolls. Um, over animals with not as high intelligence as gnolls. And our natural explorer terrain, and actually I think we're going to get a couple of them here. At level 20? Ooh, how many of those are we going to get? Let's actually take a little peek here. 6th and 10th level. So we're going to get three different natural explorer areas. And let's find out with a D8. 3D8. 2, 7, and 7. Um, well, let's repeat what the... Okay, 5. 2, 7, and 5. Our ranger is adept at tracking and hunting along coasts in swamps, and in grasslands. All right. Now as we're a tiefling... You like the ranger stocks in the Underdark or dungeons? Oh, the, uh, well, Underdark is a natural, it's, it's choice number eight here. What are you talking about? Was it, it's like the Gloomstalker, which I think is in Z uh, Xanathar's Guide. Bubonic. Norton says Norton does have dumb moments, so if they catch me at those. <laughs> Example, pushing on a door that clearly says, pu uh, the clearly says pull. Or, <laughs> Norton, you might have just had a moment. Don't let, uh, don't let the rangers find you. <laughs> You're vulnerable right now. Uh, tiefling start at 4 feet 9 inches tall and we're going to add 2d8 inches to his height we're adding 4 inches uh, so that is going to put us at 5 feet 1 inch tall we're going to take this same 4 and multiply it by 2d4 6 we're adding 24 pounds so he is 134 pounds uh, just you know wakes up you know Washes his face, brushes his teeth in his in his underwear or whatever, and he's 134 pounds. That doesn't include his backpack and all his other stuff, his swords or whatever. Yes, Victor, we are generating a tiefling. Now, lastly, for the standard random number generation for our characters, I'm going to roll a percentile and we'll find out how old he is. At 28, he is a young adult. So he's probably been through some stuff, right? If we're generating a level 20 character. Uh, da -da -da -da. Tieflings. Young adult tieflings are between 16 and 25. So I'm going to roll a d10. Four. He, uh, he is 19 years old. That's fine, DJ. We can go back and take a look at it a little bit later. Okay. We won't need this. But we will pop over to... Chapter 4, The Player's Handbook. 
This is going to flash a little bit here. Entertainer, uh, Folk Hero, Guild Artisan, and Hermit. Good. We want this page. Uh, for we have uh, Medicine and Religion skill proficiencies. We are proficient in an Herbalism kit. We get a language of our choice. So tieflings get common and infernal. And then we get one from being a hermit of whatever it is. Equipment. We will get a scroll case. So we'll add this to our backpack. Scroll case with notes. A winter blanket. Common clothes. We will get an herbalism kit. And five gold pieces. Our background is, uh, or we have a life of seclusion, and that is the D8. We rolled number eight. I was a pilgrim in search of a person, place, or relic of spiritual significance. And that has led us on our hermitage. I was a pilgrim in search of a person, place, or relic of spiritual significance. Our feature is a discovery. Discovery is a very powerful background feature to have. It is, it is very directly tied to a conversation you're going to have with your DM about the course of the game. Because your discovery is going to influence the game. It's going to lead you in certain directions and perhaps even reveal information. It's a really cool background feature. Uh, Norton goes hunting... Uh, Norton goes hunting in the grasslands here. Uh, 10 and 15. Oh, you have advantage. Norton slays the lion and gets uh, 75 experience points. DJ goes into the tomb with a 500. Um, uh, ooh, a were rat appears. Only a 14 or greater. You have disadvantage. 5 and an 11, and unfortunately, DJ, um, maybe you didn't meet your end, per se. Uh, this, you know, you, you gave it a good try as a female half-orc, uh, what were you? A female, female half-orc, not a barbarian, were you? Well, you may now be a were rat among other things. Uh, congratulations. Welcome to the club. Yeah, that's true, DJ. I think Bobicus is giving you good advice. If you if you make too long of a post, it'll show up for you on your end of Twitch chat, but it won't show up for the rest of us. Oh, Santa. Oh, Santa. So, yeah, you got turned into a female half-orc were-rat wizard. <laughs> Alrighty. All righty. Let's discover our personality traits. Four. I feel tremendous empathy for all who suffer. And number three. The leader of my community had something wise to say on every topic. And I am eager to share that wisdom. His ideal is number four, power. Solitude and contemplation are paths toward great, or I guess just mystical or magical power. You say, well, look, Matt, that clearly says, in parentheses, evil, after this this entry. And you rolled a lawful, neutral character. How, how do you make that work? It's, it, this is, each of these are one aspect of a personality. I like looking at alignment as how you express yourself as a character. It's not necessarily a, 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 a facet of your character or a part of your character. 
it is how your character interacts with the world. It's how you express your thoughts and feelings and actions. Um, and so it's fine to have this, you know, he wants to be powerful. And just because the book says this is an evil thought, people want to be strong and they have, uh, and they have very good, well, I mean, villains have good goals in mind, right? Um, but uh, l look at Ryo from Street Fighter. And I'm not even talking about like the, the Akuma influence, like the Dark Hotto version. He wants to be strong. He wants to earn his way. He wants to be, you know, bigger and better. T. Larson, thank you. Run, follow me if you want to live. Thank you for the follow. <laughs> hey, Norton, that's not a bad pull from the deck of many things. Uh, DJ says, well, her story is still going on. I've not been playing the game long. As she left her tribe to prove herself as a mighty warrior, Borba, my female half-orc, ended up with a tabaxi and traveled with it. Over the next few weeks, Borba started treating the tabaxi as her pet and tried to pet him from time to time. The tabaxi ended up getting a spirit dream and got called back home in the middle of the night as Borba slept. The tabaxi wandered away from the party. When they got back to town, Borba placed a surprisingly near-perfect lost kitty sign in front of the local tavern, managing to force it to stay uh, to stick to it with brute force before leaving for the next part of the story. And that's it, more or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, th that's a really cool story, DJ. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Norton has an army growing, huh? Our character's bond is number six. My isolation gave me great insight into a great evil that only I can destroy. Ooh, personal responsibility. And his flaw, because we are all flawed creatures, is number one. Now that I've returned to the world, I enjoy its delights a little too much. Eh, wine, women, or whoever. Um, you know, pleasures of the palate, pleasures of the flesh, um, even pleasures of the eye or the ear, right? Art and music. Uh, he's returned to the world. He thinks that only he can destroy whatever this, this you know, big monster or whatever is. And maybe he's like, eh, I deserve some, uh, you know, I deserve a good uh, manicure, pedicure. I, I deserve to be spoiled. I deserve to have um, men and women, you know, want me or want to be me. Or, you know, to, uh, to share in my experiences, that kind of a thing. Maybe he, uh, maybe he's grown a little, a little too uh, round around, around the middle. Because uh, he's enjoying food in the, in the city now that he's back from his hermitage. Um, and, and he's whining and dining when he should be uh, trying to save the world. And that is his flaw. Uh, pocket Punch uh, goes on an adventure. Random dungeon. Uh-oh, you're setting off an alarm. Stops on a 17 and a 4. Oh no, Pocket Punch, you set off the alarm and you're captured. Oh. Well, I don't know. Hopefully someone can break into the dungeon and free you, Pocket Punch. Victor, chaotic evil fighter, uses the deck of many things and becomes lawful good. Makes sense, right? Well, the deck of many things is many things. <laughs> it doesn't have to make sense. DJ says, so how much EXP does one get per minute? Um, I it's uh, I think you get uh, it's effectively one per minute, but it's in blocks of ten minutes that you watch and get your ten EXP. This is it, Norton. It all comes to this. Can you defeat the dreaded Aboleth? Only a 19 or greater can defeat it. You attack normally, adding a plus 6 modifier. It's worth 5,000 experience points if defeated. You roll a 10, plus 6 is 16, and unfortunately, Norton, you are covered in Aboleth slime and become its puppet. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, now that we have the PHB background info out of the way, let's go back to the uh, to the Wayfinder's Guide. This is going to flash a little bit, okay? And we are going to... 
Um, we are going to go to. No, where's uh, where's our background area? Ah, here we go. As a, as a part of Sharn, what what would draw someone to Sharn, which is going to be the location of our campaign this week? Okay. Uh, sailor, Outlander, we are a hermit. Here we go. So we're going to roll a d4 and find out our Eberron flavor of hermit. Two. So hermit two. You spent your life... Whoops, I scrolled. There we go. You spent your life in a hidden monastery in Sharn. Did the master of your order send you out on a mission? Or are you the lone survivor of an attack that destroyed your monastery? Ooh. All right, we're probably not going to get the military background, but I will roll odds or evens to determine if we are starting with a debt or a regret. Regrets are odds, debts are evens. Odd. We carry a regret of some kind, and that regret is going to be number two. You placed your faith and your fortune in the hands of a lover who betrayed you. You don't know if you can ever trust anyone again. Ooh. Catch up and chat here real quick. Uh, okay, people rolling some dice. There's a 14 pet. Yeah, <laughs> trust issues with a no You need at least an 18. <laughs> Tin Cat, oh boy, I'm so excited for my next D&D game. Uh, our squad just recently hit level two, and we're gonna head towards our first dungeon. Hey, if you want to, well, if you want to share the story of what happened during uh, level one, you're welcome to do so here or in details from the tabletop, Tin Cat. Uh, Victor, yes, I have uh, I have read through the Necron uh, the Necronomicon, which is the collection of short stories. Um, I I wish that I had a real Necronomicon. That'd be quite interesting. Pocket punch. This nineteen year old has been through so much. Well, if you want to share stories too, Pocket, you're welcome to do so. All right, so there's our regret. Uh, here is our custom Sharn slash Eberron flavored twist on the background. And let's take a look here at... Uh, Hermit doesn't offer uh, anything here for a, a particular military background because you've been hidden away from people for so long. Let's see here. That's Mark, our, our Dragon Mark Quirk. Okay. So now, we have effectively a complete background, and we have our personality of our character, right? I feel tremendous empathy for all who suffer. The leader of my community had something wise to say, which can joint in, like, like uh, we, can, we can make a, a joint effort between those personality traits and the special Sharn flavored hermit that we rolled up about spending our life in a hidden monastery. And where we sent out on a mission, was it attacked and we're the lone survivor? Kind of an Avatar the Last Airbender kind of a thing. And we placed, uh, this is our regret, we placed our faith and fortune in the hands of a lover who betrayed us. You don't know if you can ever trust anyone again. What if we gave up, uh, you know, what if we were, we were in a relationship with someone and... Um, and uh, he or she said that, yeah, we'll wait for you. 
Uh, and so we, we had wealth of, of some magnitude and influence. And our lover said, no, you know, like, um, or we told our lover, well, look, I, I need to do this. I need to find out who I am truly before we, you know, get into a relationship. And so I need, uh, I want a couple years of study. You know, will you wait for me? And our lover says, yes, 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 that's fine. Oh, very good, darling. I trust you. Here's my things. Only to then find out that when we exit the hermitage, we we come out enlightened and we find the revelation out that uh, hey, maybe this could even be the discovery. What if our lover turns out to be kind of the villain? What if our lover, um, our, our, you know, the person you know, who we've been in a relationship with, uh, is the one who maybe use that information and use that influence and that money in order to uh, destroy the very monastery in which we were training or has otherwise betrayed us and has created animosity and this 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 regretful feeling of not being able to trust other people because that's a very regretful feeling not being able to trust others is um it, it makes you feel so tired and diminished, having to be on alert all the time. Tin Cat, you got attacked by a swarm of six giant frogs. My character, even though I was the only one with armor, got bit by two separate ones. Then we got our, our then got our way to deliver the carriage back to where we got it in a giant. Are, are you in a swamp or something, Tin Cat? Uh, you haven't played D and D in probably six or in probably six or so much I don't have any good stories I can think of six months six years oh six months okay got it um, I'm just waiting for the opportunity to get back in the saddle uh, of my hell paladin Sidolphus wolf Sidolphus wolf it's it's fun if you say it that way Sidolphus wolf that that kind of VW that wolf wolf Sidolphus wolf What's a hell paladin? Is that like an oath breaker? Is that a custom? Uh, is that a custom oath? Pocket punch. Okay, we have our background. Now it is time to investigate our race. I'm gonna do this in two parts. Here's the tiefling that we get standard in our player's handbook. We're going to consult the Wayfinder's Guide as well and see what happens to tieflings in, um, in Eberron. Tieflings are rarely seen in Eberron, but there are a few paths for a tiefling character. Many tieflings are born to the Carrion tribes, the barbarians who live in the demon wastes. Such tieflings are touched by the fiendish forces bound beneath the wastes and are considered to be blessed by the tribes. If you're playing such a tiefling, why have you left the wastes? It could be that you are destined to serve an evil purpose, perhaps even serving as an avatar for an imprisoned demon overlord, and you are fleeing from that destiny. Other tieflings are shaped not by demonic powers, but by the influence of the planes. Such tieflings may be born in manifest zones when planes are coter, uh, coterminous. Planar tieflings are isolated oddities, often seen as exotic and strange, but not necessarily evil. There is one tiefling nation in Corvair, the Venomous Dements, a state, a city-state hidden on the far side of the Droam. The tieflings of the Venomous Dements are descended from Sarlonan mages who bargained with dark powers, and the lords of the Dements are powerful warlocks and wizards. The Venomous Dements has had no significant contact with the Five Nations, and few people know it exists. Your character could be an envoy, an exile, or simply an adventurer driven by a desire to see what lies beyond your magical kingdom. All right, so we are not prone to getting a dragon mark naturally by virtue of being a tiefling in Eberron. What that means, though, is, well, we can possibly get an aberrant dragon mark. 
The 12 Dragon Marks are tied to specific bloodlines and passed down through families. They are reliable and predictable, and their powers are con uh, constructive. They create, they heal, they protect. But there's another kind of Dragon Mark. Marks that are unpredictable and dangerous to both the bearer and the people around them. Someone with such a mark can kill with a touch or control minds with a glance. Aberrant marks often appear when people from different Dragon Mark families produce a child. And for this reason, such unions are absolutely forbidden. Uh, forbidden by the Twelve, uh, like the major pantheon. But aberrant dragon marks can appear on members of any race, at any age, regardless of bloodline. No two aberrant dragon marks are exactly alike, even if they grant the same power. They may appear and manifest in different ways. If two aberrant marks might grant firebolt, one mark may be formed from scar tissue, while another is traced on the skin in lines of cold fire. While aberrant dragon marks can be disturbing, on the surface, an aberrant mark seems no more dangerous or threatening than the powers of a sorcerer. So, what makes them significant? First of all, aberrant marks always have flaws. These may not actively hurt a character, but they are always a burden in some way. A burden that could drive a weak-willed person to madness. It takes time for a character to learn to control their mark, and in time, people may be hurt. If an aberrant mark grants the firebolt or grants firebolt, the person who carries it might have severely burned or even killed a loved one. Imagine having the power to cast charm person, but being unable to control it and having people you care about suddenly becoming slavishly devoted to you. All of these factors have led to the general superstition that people with aberrant dragon marks are dangerous and their marks drive them crazy or turn them into sociopaths. These are things that can happen. People have a right to be afraid, but it is possible for an aberrant to learn to control their mark and to endure the flaw. Aberrant marks are feared for another reason too. Long ago, aberrant marks were more frequent and some people had aberrant marks that held greater powers. Aberrant leader Halas Tarkanen could devastate cities with powerful earthquakes, while the Dreambreaker shattered mines. The Lady of the Plague wielded disease in the command and commanded hordes of vermin. The dragon-marked houses united in an inquisition called the War of the Mark. Some say that this was a persecution of innocents, but most feared the aberrants and stood by as the houses hunted them down. Ever since the War of the Mark, aberrant dragon marks have been few in number and relatively weak. And they spelled it W-E-E-K and E-A-K. Again, this is playtest material that will receive updates. But hey, we caught we caught one, huh? But since the morning, aberrant marks have been appearing in greater numbers, and people wonder if those who carry them could develop greater power. If you develop an aberrant mark, you can choose a flaw from this list, uh, or you and the DM can develop a unique flaw of your own. All right, so normally we would need to uh, have a character that develop that takes an aberrant dragon mark as a feat. We did roll that this 20th level character who would receive five stat bumps would, um, would in fact uh, take all five stat bumps. Though because I do want to showcase Eberron and we have plenty of ability score improvements to spare, why don't we go down and give this character, this tiefling who normally wouldn't receive a mark, why don't we give him an aberrant dragon mark and see what happens. So we're going to come down here. Um, feet... Aberrant Dragon Mark. This is going to increase our con score by one. You learn a cantrip from the Sorcerer spell list. In addition, choose a first level spell from the Sorcerer spell list. You learn that spell and can cast it at its lowest level. Once you cast it, you must finish a long rest before you can cast it again. Constitution is your spell casting ability for these spells. Um, okay, so cantrips, we are going to get... Um, actually, so we have, uh, we're going to get one for being a tiefling, and then we're going to get Aberrant Dragon Mark is going to give us uh, a Sork one. And then we're going to learn a first level spell. Aberrant Dragon Mark, Sork. Based on Khan. You can increase the power of your aberrant spells at the risk of your own vitality. When you cast a spell with your aberrant mark, you can use one of your hit dice to increase the spell's level by one. 
Immediately after you cast the spell, roll the hit die. You take damage equal to the number rolled. And this is also going to give us a uh, Aberrant Mark Flaw. And we're going to roll a d8 for what that's going to do. Four. The skin around your mark has an unusual appearance. Burned, scaly, withered, etc. It doesn't tickle like the dra like the legit dragon mark of our first character <laughs> um, has. Okay. There we go. Now we're going to go back to Tiefling and fill in the blanks. Whoops. Here we go. Uh, I'm sorry, let me catch up in chat first. Pocket Punch, I'm just waiting for the opportunity to get back in the saddle of my Hell Paladin. Oh yes, uh, Sidolfus Wolf. It's a custom oath that my DM and I created. It's kind of like a warlock where he got his powers by making a deal with the devil. Ooh. Not only created... Uh, not really created, though. We kind of just mixed some already created options for it. Then added some of our own flair. That That is the fun and the power of D&D, &D, Pocket Punch. I'm glad that you're, you're stretching your wings... Uh, and you are doing some homebrew stuff uh, with your DM. That's awesome. Uh, Caden, thank you very much for the host. Um, Santa, that sounds brutal. Are you talking to uh, Pocket Punch? Or are you talking about the Aberrant Dragon Mark? DJ, who goes there? It's late and you're on watch. Your party member's been gone a while. Eventually, you sense someone or something approaching. You hail the figure, hoping it's your friend. Who goes there? Slow Cool, is that you? It stops and moves forward and suddenly responds, Pod Champ! What do you do? DJ says I'd prep fireball, looking towards the figure, ready to fire if needed. Well, if uh, Slow Cool, if you're out there, it's uh, this is a fun roleplay prompt for you. If you want to step up and be like, No, 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 it's cool, it's me, it's, it's Slow Cool. You know, like I, I just, you sent me out to go gather firewood. Oh, you're talking about the Aberrant Dragon Mark. Yeah, so uh, we can add a little bit of uh, fun flair and f uh, flavor to this character uh, with this aberrant dragon mark. Okay, intelligence increases by one and charisma increases by two. Let's see now. What is next? We're medium-sized. Our speed is 30 feet. Run. 15 climb. 15 swim. Zero fly. We do get dark vision out to 60 feet. We have hellish resistance, so that is resistance to fire damage. We're going to fill in the little button up here. Infernal Legacy. That's right, IL. Infernal Legacy. You know the Thaumaturgy cantrip. And once you reach third level, you can cast the hellish rebuke spell once per day as a second level spell. And once you reach fifth level, you can also cast darkness. So we're going to come down here. Both of those are second level spells. So Infernal Legacy is going to give us these two here. Hellish Rebuke. And Darkness. Hellish Rebuke is offering is operating off of Charisma. And Darkness is just its own thing. So what we're going to do, this is going to be a, a Sork uh, spell... Operating off of Khan. And we have our languages already set. So that is what we get for being a... Uh, that's what we get for being a uh, tiefling. We'll just go sort here. Now we are going to pop over to chapter 3 
and discover what we get for being a ranger. Twentieth level! Everything! We get it all! <laughs> uh, let's see. Here's our spell slots. Four, three, 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 and two. Woohoo! We know all the way up to fifth level spells. That's pretty good, though. Uh, Ranger is a is a um, half spellcaster, like a paladin, and arcane tricksters and eldritch knights are one third spellcasters. We are a D10 hit die class, and we get twenty of these suckers because we're level twenty. Go us! Armor. Light, medium, and uh, shields? Yes, shields. We are proficient with simple and martial weapons. No tool proficiencies. Our saving throws are strength and dex. And we get to choose three skills from the following. Animal handling, athletics, insight, investigation, nature, perception, Stealth and Survival. Well, let's look at our personality again. Who were we before we were an adventurer, right? How did we grow up? What were our circumstances? And consider, right, consider this Eberron flare on Tieflings as well. Where did they come from? You know, is he a ranger from, you know, from these badlands? Um, and he's, he's out exploring? Santa, oh yeah, I'm sorry, you said that. Omit the fifth, hey, it's good to see you again. I wasn't thinking about a wizard sorcerer build. What would you be able to? Uh, what would you be able to quicken spell for your wizard spells? I believe so. Let's take a look real quick. Sorcerer. Let's go to meta magic. When you cast a spell that has a casting time of one action, yeah, that's the only requirement. It doesn't say sorcerer spell. So Amit. Uh, and again, it's good to see you back. All it says is when you cast a spell that has a casting time of one action, you can spend two sorcery points to change the casting time to one bonus action for the casting. Now, bear in mind that you cannot take... Uh, it, let's say you do fireball, okay? Classic spell. You can't quicken a fireball and then cast a fireball. Even though fireball was made into a bonus action... In the spellcasting chapter, it says that uh, you can only cast um, another spell if it's a, uh, a cantrip. So you can cast a cantrip as a standard and then quicken a fireball to get a pew pew to get a, a double spell. So just make sure you remember that. Now look, Rick, there's no reason to bring that here. If you want to sit back and enjoy the conversation, if you want to talk about any roleplay experience you've had, you are welcome to do so. Have a seat, be a part of the conversation, but there's nothing to gain by coming in here and making that remark. Yep, no problem, Amit. Um, it, it's something that can be, uh, it's something that can confuse some people. So remember, if you're going to try and cast two spells in a round, uh, one of them, uh, you can take your, your one action and turn it into a bonus, and then your normal action can be a cantrip. go to Ranger. Yeah, I, it could be a phantom. It could have just been your imagination. Or it, maybe it's some kind of a will-o'-wisp that was just out in the forest trying to lure you away from camp, DJ. 
We were looking at skills. Animal handling, athletics, insight, investigation. So let's see. I feel tremendous empathy for all who suffer. Ooh, that could be insight. The leader of my community had something to, uh, to say on every topic, and I'm eager to share that wisdom. Uh, solitude and contemplation are paths toward mystical and magical power. My isolation gave me great insight into a uh, great evil that only I can destroy. Uh, now that I've returned to the world, I enjoy its delights a little too much. You spent your life hidden in a monastery. Okay, you... Uh, are we sent on a mission? Or are we the lone survivor in attack? It seems like uh, we need to find also this lover who jilted us. We might need to track her down. So I almost want to say insight and investigation. The skin around your mark has an unusual appearance. So I don't know. I think we might have a, a, like a stalker. Uh, like, you know, he'll he's just stalking through the city trying to find like a private detective. He's trying to find the person who did this to his monastery. Insight, investigation, and perception... I think are very straightforward for him. If you have another option out there, if you think that his three skills should be different, please let me know. Again, this is not my character. This is one we're building mutually. And if you have a different concept of him, please shout it out. Okay, uh, you start the f with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted to, uh, to you by your background. Scale mail or leather armor. Uh, if he's going to be more the hunter type, like a, like a, a, a bounty. Oh, okay, Santa. I'm glad we're, I'm glad we're uh, in sync. We're, we're syncopating together. Probably going to go for the scale mail. I don't think he's very... He's not a hidey ranger. He's not stealthy. He doesn't want to hide. He's, he's a tracker. And in fact, I'm sure his animal companion will help him out with that. So he's going to take some scale mail. Uh, let's see, two short swords. He is, in fact, a two-weapon fighter. So we're going to go short sword X2. A dungeoneer's pack or an explorer's pack, given the nature of Sharn and the fact that he might have to do a lot of climbing and whatnot, probably a dungeoneer's pack. Lastly, a longbow and a quiver with 20 arrows. At first level, we will gain a favored enemy. Choose a type. Aberrations, beasts, celestials, constructs, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, giants, monstrosities, oozes, plants, or undead. Alternatively, you can select two races of humanoids, such as gnolls and orcs, as favored enemies. You have advantage on survival checks to track your favorite enemies, as well as on intelligence to recall information about them. When you gain this feature, you also learn one language of your choice that is spoken by your favorite enemies, if they speak one at all. You choose one additional favorite enemy, as well as an associated language, at 6th and 14th level. As you gain levels, your choices should reflect the types of monsters you have encountered on your adventures. His first favorite enemy, it, it could be fiends, in fact, Santa. Uh, we could choose that because, look, if he's favoring, if we go up here, he's favoring his human part, his, his human half. Maybe he was born to humans, and he is one of these, um, these plane-touched uh, tieflings. And something has happened, or, you know, there's just, he's the one who's hunting down demons, in a way. So we go favorite enemy, and we're going to get three. So if we come up here and his first one are fiends, well, he already does speak infernal, but this would probably give him abyssal to speak. Gold Public, I like to think the lute and cello and oboe sounds, etc. are a small chamber orchestra right behind my green screen. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying the background music as, too, uh, as well, Gold Public, and that hopefully it's adding to the experience.
Uh, let's see. So he, along the coast, is pre presumably where he was, uh, he was facing fiends, right? If this should match the monsters that we've been to, we also are proficient in the swamp and the grasslands. So if he's tracking down enemy types, what would be a swamp monster? Would that be undead? Do you, do you see undead in swamps? Do you see oozes or plants in swamps? What do you think is associated um, or two humanoid species? He could go two humanoid species. What do you think that he'd... Uh... Oh, he's good against plant monsters? Okay. And then lastly, in the grasslands. Are we building the Abyss Watcher from Dark Souls? I Unfortunately, I haven't played that game. It's been a while since I've seen it played, so I, I don't get the reference, Santa. I'm sorry. So in the grasslands, uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of monsters would he be hunting? Uh, beasts? Or, now, monstrosities are like... Uh, Not necessarily like a dire badger. Oh, like an owl bear would be a monstrosity, right? <laughs> Thank you, Santa. Giants, beasts, etc. And I don't roll this randomly, at least I don't think we've ever done a random roll, because this is very good storytelling. We already know the character's personality, so let's develop it with conscious choices and give him a backstory. So we need a Grasslands-associated enemy type for him to have as a favorite enemy. Our, our list is... Hey, Chewie, good to see you again. Aberrations, Beasts, Celestials, Constructs, Dragons... Elementals, Fae, Fiends, Giants, Monstrosities, Oozes, Plants, or Undead. No, Santa. In fact, that could be very compelling. While Eberron itself is not a... Um, don't make it meerkats. <laughs> Um, what we could even do, because dragons, as it is even said in the campaign setting, are, are not that prevalent as a... There's dragons flying all over. What we might be able to do is we could put dragons, but maybe if you talk to your DM, people who are dragon marked, maybe they count as dragons for purposes of, of, this, um, of this favored enemy. Maybe someone crossed him. And so now he can track down people who have this draconic ancestry that is manifested as a dragon mark. And and ironically, he bears an aberrant dragon mark himself. Okay, we have our natural explorer terrains. Um, oh, I guess this could mean, then, that we could speak, uh, Draconic. Natural, there's our fighting style, we have that. We are a two-weapon fighter. When you engage in two-weapon fighting, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the second attack. DJ says, uh, that's a DM question for sure and can lead itself to fun storytelling. Yes, indeed. When you're building, please, use what's in the PHB as a solid guide. But don't just take everything either purely literally or if it says that you get a longbow and 20 arrows, that's it. There's no discussion further. Negotiate with your DM if you don't want a longbow. Do you want a short bow instead because it's more thematic? Or you want a short bow and you want the change back on what you would normally have gotten from a longbow? Um, do, you, uh, do you even not see yourself using a bow because you want to be a pure melee fighter? In that case... I don't know, ask your, um, ask your DM for another appropriate weapon that is of similar GP cost if your DM even sees that as being a thing. 
Ars, uh, Ars Fantastica, what do you think about Primeval Awareness for uh, Rangers? I think it's busted. Well, uh, we will we'll actually get to that in a second, Ars, and uh, that'll that'll remind me of what's there, and we can discuss that. Chua, yeah, you had to put together for a character for Adventures League. Oh, okay. Or a short bow due to its gnome ranger. Yeah, that's true, because a long bow uh, would be, I think, a, a disadvantage, because I think it's a, a large weapon. I'd, I'd have to double check that in chapter five. We do get spell casting, and wisdom is, in fact, our spell casting um, um, ability for it. We'll get our ranger archetype of Beastmaster. We'll fill that in after we get our goodies for being a 20th level ranger. <laughs> All right, here's primeval awareness that Ars Fantastic was talking about. Let me list this here. Primeval awareness. Beginning at third level, you can use your action and expend one ranger spell slot to focus your awareness on the region around you. For one minute per level of the spell slot you expend, you can sense whether the following types of creatures are present within one mile of you or within up to six miles of you if you're in favored terrain. Aberrations, Celestials, Dragons, Elementals, Fey, Fiends, and Undead. This feature doesn't reveal the creature's location or number. I No, I don't think offhand. I, I, I've had a player in my last campaign uh, who used Primeval Awareness, and um, I mean, all it does is it senses, uh, it, it's a yes or no, on are any of these creatures within one mile or six miles of me. That's a big radar sweep. It doesn't tell you, um, it doesn't tell you the specific directions. So you may be heading north and there could be an undead one mile to the south of you and you use primeval awareness and it'll ping that there's an undead within a mile of you. But if you could travel a mile in any direction in the circle, you know, I'm a sucker for giving in to the players if they have a good backstory and the stuff they're asking for works with that backstory. Uh, this is this is just the PHB ours. Let's take a look if there has been official errata, though. Racial traits, uh, class features, fighter, paladin, ranger. Nothing in the in the errata for that that I'm seeing here. Hmm. Nothing offhand that I'm seeing in the errata. Combat, surprise round, ready to action, all kinds of clarifications, by the way. Uh, the exclamation point errata is a very good resource for you all. Spell attacks and so forth, so... I don't know, hopefully, hopefully that answered your question, Ars. There's an updated ranger from Unearthed Arcana. Oh, um, so Ars, because we're sticking to the core rule books, I do not use Unearthed Arcana in our character building exercises. Uh, 
uh, ASI's extra attack we will get. Land stride. Move through non-magical difficult terrain. Costs you no extra movement. That's very good. We can also hide in plain sight. And vanish. 18th level, we get Feral Senses. Uh, you can use the Hide action as a bonus action on your turn. Also, you can't be tracked by non-magical means unless you choose to leave a trail. Feral Senses at 18th level, you gain preternatural senses that help you fight creatures you can't see. When you attack a creature you can't see, your inability to see it doesn't impose disadvantage on your attack rolls against it. You're also aware of the location of any invisible creature within 30 feet of you, provided that the creature isn't hidden from you and you aren't blinded or deafened. That's pretty good. Lastly, Foe Slayer. This is our capstone ability. At 20th level, you become an unparalleled hunter of your enemies. Once on each of your turns, you can add your wisdom modifier to the attack roll or the damage roll of an attack you make against one of your favorite enemies. You can choose this feature before or after the roll, but before any effects of the roll are applied. So yeah, adding an, uh, adding an extra base, what, probably by that level, maybe two or three damage. It's not bad. It is to a favorite enemy, but presumably you're hunting your favorite enemy, especially by 20th level. Um, I don't know why you take goblins if you're a dragon hunter. <laughs> okay, ranger archetypes. We are the, we're the beast master here. So we are going to get a ranger's companion. Uh, third level, you get a beast companion that accompanies you in your adventures. Uh, choose a beast that's no larger than medium and has a challenge rating of one fourth or lower. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to add stuff to that. The beast obeys your commands. Uh, da -da -da. Exceptional training. Beginning at 7th level on any of your turns when your beast companion doesn't attack, you can use a bonus action to command the beast to take the dash, disengage, dodge, or help actions on its turn. Um, so help, it can aid you and you get advantage on your attacks if you didn't want your beast to attack. We also get Bestial Fury. Starting at 11th level, your beast companion can make two attacks when you command it to use the attack action. Nice, huh? And share spells. Beginning at 15th level, when you cast a spell targeting yourself, you can also affect your beast companion with the spell if the beast is within 30 feet of you. That could be a curative spell. That could be a, a buff of some kind. That's, that's pretty good. Mastacina, um, a kobold companion... Nah, unfortunately, a kobold, uh, a kobold isn't going to count because a kobold is not a beast, technically. Uh, however, uh, I don't know if you'd count kobolds as a more advanced iguana or something. You could have a lizard companion of some kind. That's kind of the running joke, Santa, is that kobolds are dragonkin. Eh. <laughs> they might consider themselves to be descendants of dragons. Lizards don't talk sadness. Oh, don't be sad, Mast. Come on. Turn that frown upside down. Okay. We have uh, we've built our we we have the chassis of our character. We have things pretty well in place, and now it's time to drop the engine in this 20th level character. We are going to use the standard array and uh well, 
see what we got here. I think Dex is going to be very important to our character. Um, for attacking and for... Um, uh, for attacking and for uh, defense. So we can give ourselves... Let's see. Technically, if we're in medium armor, our dex bonus maxes out at plus two. Which means if we don't go strength, then we... We're, we're wasting, quote-unquote, extra dexterity. But the thing is, if we want to do the two-weapon fighting... Yeah, some, some rogues might want... Or I'm sorry, some rangers might want strength higher than dex if they go two-weapon fighting. Light weapon, small and easy to handle, making it ideal for use when fighting with two weapons. See the rules for... Okay, in Chapter 9. Let's go check that out real quick. When you take the attack action and attack with a light melee weapon that you're holding in one hand... You can use a bonus action to attack with a different light melee weapon you're holding in the other hand. You don't add your ability modifier to the damage of the bonus attack, unless that modifier is negative. If either your weapon has the thrown property, you can throw the weapon instead of making a melee attack with it. If either weapon has the thrown property, you can throw it. So when you take the attack action and attack with a light melee weapon you're holding in one hand, you can use a bonus action to attack with a different light melee weapon. So we don't have the feat that takes away the light, meaning our short swords are not going to count. They, they are finesse. So that's in chapter 9. Let's go back to Ranger real quick and see what would be optimal. When you engage in two-weapon fighting, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the second attack. Okay, so we need light weapons in order to do this. So in this case, instead of the two short swords, because we're not taking the two-weapon fighting feat, it says two simple melee weapons. What we might want to do is go uh, two daggers or... Two light hammers could be interesting. Or even, uh... Ooh, even hand axe could be interesting. Light and throne. Oh, maybe fighting with two axes could be kind of cool, huh? Alright, so if we do this instead of the short swords, we give, uh, we give him two hand axes... the throne so we can slash down and then we can we can throw uh we can throw our other hand axe if we want to or we can just go slash slash with two hand axes you want to give him a sickle we could do that too we can go hand axe uh, we can go one hand axe and one sickle if you'd like So, uh, dexterity, mechanically speaking, a 14 is as high as we'll ever really need it to go. Because we're going to be wearing medium armor, and that's the maximum cap. Meaning that we can put our 15 in perhaps strength, 
Um, we could go f uh, 15, 14, probably 13. Twelve, ten, and eight in charisma. If you have if you have a different proposition for the stat spread, you are welcome to throw it out there, okay? So at level one, that would give us a thirteen con, an eleven int, thirteen whiz, and a ten charisma. Now, uh, so we've taken uh, the feat of the Aberrant Dragon Mark. Um, con and Wisdom are going to be important to us. Um, oh, wait, hang on. That was one, in, one Int, one Con, two Charisma, and that was an eight. I'm sorry, let me go back and make sure I'm not... 15, 14, 13... I'm, I'm getting myself way more confused than I really need to be. Okay, 15, 14, 13. Maybe we go, actually, 13, 12, and 10. That would then put our con to a 13. Whoops. Our int to an 11. And our charisma to a 10. Of our five stat bumps, one of them is going to take the aberrant dragon mark. That's going to give us four more stat bumps where we had two to one ability or one to two abilities. So we could bump up uh, our first one. We can bring our strength to a 16 and our con to a 14. Twelve and fourteen. Let's bring our strength up a little higher. And probably is he really spell casty? Because that's gonna either put our strength at a 20 or our wisdom to a 16. Um You spent your life in a hidden monastery. Did you mas uh, did the Master Order send you out on a mission, or are you the lone survivor? You placed your faith and fortune in the hands of a lover who betrayed you. You don't know if you can ever trust anyone again. The skin around your mark has an unusual appearance. Uh, I feel tremendous empathy. Ooh, these are all wisdom, like, insight-based stuff. Uh, leader of my community had something wise to say on every topic, and I'm eager to share that wisdom. Um, solitude and contemplation. My isolation gave me great insight into an evil that only I can destroy. I think we're going to go and bring Wisdom up to a 16. Oops. There we go. That's going to give us a strength of 4, Dex 2, Con 2, Int 1, Wisdom 3, and Charisma 0. Yeah, a High Wisdom does reflect that. I agree. So yeah, I think that last uh, that last bump should have gone into wisdom. You are correct, Ars Fantastica, in my opinion, for whatever that counts. I don't know, presumably here because because you believe I halfway know what I'm doing. That being said, this is an interactive channel, and I I even if you have a different opinion than I do, I I I want you to share it. I'm not going to put you on blast. I'm not going to put you on the spot. At worst, I'm going to ask, so what is your reasoning supporting that? And you know what? Just like ours did, if I had a different opinion and I'm like, no, we're going Kronk the Barbarian instead of a, a wise uh, a wise hermit. Um, ours gave a differing opinion and backed it up, and that is perfectly fine. You know, change my mind. <laughs> Our proficiency bonus is six. Uh, let's see. Well, 
now we can... We ha He's earned a name. If any of you have a name for this character, this male tiefling... Uh, saving throw is going to be 10 strength and 8 dex. Uh, athletics is natural for 2s all the way down for dex stuff. 2 for con. Um, intelligence is going to be 1 except for investigation of 7 and religion of 7. Wisdom is going to be 3, animal handling 3, survival 3. And then insight, medicine, and perception are going to be 9s. And then Charisma, we're just going to put a goose egg in. Whew. All right, we're not a very charismatic party so far. You like this old name of 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8? <laughs> uh, you want to call him Galifax the Third? So is, is Galifax his first name, or is that his family name, and he is the third of the Galifaxes? In which case, um, Mastacinia, Mastacin, Mastacina or Mastacina? Anyway, you let me know and I'll do my best to remember that. Um, does he have a first name? So he's something Galifax the Third. Or, oh, or, or I guess we can combine it. Ars Fantastica, Karak Galifax the Third. How about that? Karak Galifax the Third. Initiative is going to be plus two because that's simply a dexterity check. Remember that for Jack of All Trades and the uh, the fighter uh, the fighter champion ability. It's like prime athlete or something like that. Hit points, you get your maximum at first level, so we're getting 10. Then for each additional level, so 19, we are getting half plus one our hit die, so that's six, right? Half of 10 is five, plus one is six. Then for every level, all 20, we are getting bonus hit points equal to our constitution modifier. So here we go. Here's our here's our, our very basic algebra one. Here's 40. Uh, let's see, so that's 54. Um, 54, so that's 114. So that's 124, 164 hit points. Armor class, scale mail starts at, uh, scale mail starts at, uh, 14? Plus dex up to 2, I think. Scale mail, yep, 14 plus dex modifier, max 2. So we are rocking a 16 here. Yeah, that, it's a, it's a nice amount. You can take a couple hits. Our hand axe uh, is going to be a plus 10 to hit. Same with our sickle. Now, both the hand axe and the sickle... Well, I think the sickle's finesse. I think the hand axe isn't. Uh, that means we could use dexterity if we wanted to, but strength is going to be the dominant score, so we should stick to that. Longbow, however, is going to be a plus 8, because that is for sure a dexterity-based weapon. Therefore, for Hand Axe and Sickle, we are going to get plus four extra damage on them. And for our Longbow, we're only going to get plus two. And what we can do, uh, because we're fighting with two light weapons, a Hand Axe and a Sickle, we can use a bonus action to attack. Like, so if we attack with our Sickle, we can then uh, spend a bonus action to attack with our Hand Axe. That attack can be a melee attack, or because the Hand Axe has the Throne property, we can throw our hand axe as a bonus action. And because we took the two-weapon fighting style, we can add our bonus damage to the secondary attack, because normally you wouldn't get that ability to do so. Um, Ars Fantastica, we do not normally, um, because that, that would be a different uh, like wealth levels. And then we'd be going through the, the DMG and adding about another hour, hour and a half for uh, magic item, uh, for magic items and things like that. And so what I'd rather do is let's create the character because the character's not defined by the, the magic boots that he or she wears. 
if you explain to people that, oh yeah, my character's awesome, uh, she has these boots that lets her climb on the ceiling, and she has this sword uh, that, that glows uh, when, you know, when goblins are around, and oh, she has this really powerful magic, uh, this, uh, this spell scroll uh, that'll just like nuke any giant that comes our way. You're not describing a character, you're describing a mannequin that is showcasing inanimate objects. In my opinion. And I'm not saying that, look, if any of you describe your characters that way, and it's a source of pride about the things you have, get into it. Though the approach that I want to take is let's build the character. You can always put a magic, you know, cold uh, sword in a character's hand, but you gotta have a character first before you can give them magic items and epic level whatevers. Santa, you gotta go. All right, hey, thanks for joining us again, Santa. It's a pleasure to have you around. Bonjour, Santa's Blair. I hope you have a, how do you say, good day? Oh, oh. There, I had to get a little French in. Just for you, buddy. Mon frère. Just for you. So if it is juste. J-U-S, that is a different word altogether than just without the T. Juice for you. Orange? Pom? <laughs> Passive perception, by the way, is 19. That's 10 plus your perception modifier, and that represents the natural awareness of... Our character. He's pretty astute. Oh, what else is left? No, Pomplemousse! Oh, how you say? Grapefruit? Maui! Pomplemousse pour moi petit déjeuner! All that's left, it seems, is to give our character uh, spells, right? We're casting off of Wisdom as a Ranger. Um, that means we have uh, 3 plus Proficiency is 9. That is our attack bonus. And you add 8 to your attack bonus to get your save DC versus the effects of a spell. We have... Four, three, 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 two for spell slots. And for cantrips, well, rangers don't normally get them. However, Infernal Legacy does give us Thaumaturgy, or Small Miracles is kind of what it translates to. And uh, for our Aberrant Dragon Mark, uh, we get some kind of a Sorcerer cantrip. Mastacina, du fromage? Du fromage? Du fromage? So let's pick out our Aberrant Dragon Mark spell real quick, and then we will get to, uh, we'll get to our Ranger spells. And we will have a complete character. Ooh, ooh, we will not! But we'll save the last part for part three. I want you all out there, this is your homework assignment. We need to give our character a beast companion. Based on what you've seen of him, right? We have this hermit who's who's been seeking, uh, you know, he has tremendous empathy, the, you know, has been in meditation, is perhaps out to reclaim or to track down the person who took the life of his master and everyone who was in his temple uh, for, you know, for killing him while he was out or killing them. Uh, we placed our faith and fortune in the hands of a lover who betrayed us. Who is our beast companion going to be? I want you to think about that. And when we come back, I, I would like your opinions on what kind of what kind of an animal would our ranger be rolling around with. Let's go to sorcerer spells. Here we go. Cantrips. Acid Splash, Blade Ward, Chill Touch, Dancing Lights, Firebolt, Friends, Light, Mage Hand, Mending, Message, Minor Illusion, Poisson Spray? Well, that's different than Poison Spray. Pan en Poisson is not the same as Pain and Poison. Prestidigitation, Ray of Frost, Shocking Grasp, and True Strike. 
an aberrant dragon mark is manifesting, it should probably be should probably be some kind of an attack power, I'm thinking. Um Unless Mage Hand could come in very handy, that could be an interesting one. We're a Tiefling also. Firebolt could be thematic. Although, too, if we're going to be up, if we're going to be up on people. Right? If we're a two-weapon fighter... Oh, but then again, it wouldn't hurt to have a ranged option, either. We are casting off of Khan, though. Hmm. So maybe our first level ability should be an attack spell. The other one can be a, uh... The other one can be a, uh... Maybe a support spell of some kind. So what would lend support to a hermit? I mean, Mage Hand could work. Mending is always a good one. Ooh, Message could be a good one. That way you don't have to talk. If you're in a hermitage and you have to be very quiet and studious, you can you can practice and you could message other people to send your thoughts to them without speaking anything. Oh, you think uh, you think uh, True Strike, uh, Ars, and Mastacina? You have Mending, but your body could never be Mending. Pouty Lips, hey, hey, can you help me think of some good ways to use Commune with Nature, the level 10 path feature for Barbarian? Yes, uh, we can certainly do that, Pouty Lips. Uh, we are finishing up our, our Ranger spell list here real quick. I'm going to take another break to refill my pitcher with some ice water. When we come back in about five minutes after that, um, we can we can sit down and help you out with that. Do you have a little bit of time left, Pouty Lips, or are you, an emerge are you like here and you can only stick around for a little bit of time? Communication. Oh, especially with our uh, communication with our our, um, our our beast, right? Our animal companion. I think message can work very well here. Thaumaturgy and message. There we go. So our Sork first level. Uh, let's see. Burning hands, charm person, chromatic orb, color spray, comp language, detect magic, disguise self, expeditious retreat, false life, feather fall, fog cloud, jump, mage armor, magic missile. Ray of Sickness, Shield, Silent Image, Sleep, Thunder Wave, and Witch Bolt. You think Disguise Self? Yeah, a utilitarian spell probably better reflects the character's background. I agree, ours. Sorcerer first level. Uh, yes, Charm Person is a uh, is a spell we could take as our Sorcerer first level from our Aberrant Dragon Mark. And if we go down here, can we cast this at higher levels? Yes, we can. And that's important because our Dragon Mark lets us cast that spell at higher levels if we're willing to take damage in return for it uh, by spending our hit dice. When you cast this spell using a spell slot of second level or higher, you can target one additional creature for each slot above that. Must make a wisdom saving throw. Does so with advantage if you or your companions are fighting it. Uh, if it fails the saving throw, it is charmed by you until the spell ends or until you or your companions do anything harmful to it. The charmed creature regards you as fr a friendly acquaintance. When the spell ends, the creature knows it was charmed by you. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it could be a way that we can use our Dragon Mark, and if we want to take the damage to cast it at higher levels, we can do so. So, do you all think that uh, Charm Person should be our, our first level uh, Aberrant Dragon Mark? 
spell. Let's go back to chapter 11 real quick. Actually, let's go back to Ranger. I gotta reference something. Uh, I gotta re uh, reference something here. We are going to get... So at level 2, we are going to get two spells. Level 3. Level 5. Seventeen and nineteen. There we go. Now we can pop back over to spells for the ranger. Pouty lips, uh, it's not going to be that long. I'm going to get up and, and refill my pitcher with ice water, uh, stretch. I might use the restroom real quick, so I'm, I think it's only going to be about five minutes here. Okay, so we are a beast master. Presumably, we can already find uh, our, our beast, so maybe animal friendship wouldn't be important. Um... Actually, I should take my break now. If we can consider which spells that he'll take, because for a ranger, the spells you pick up is going to reflect a lot like your favorite enemies and the terrain that you've been traveling through. You're going to pick up spells that are going to be appropriate for the things that you're doing throughout the campaign. And so your spell list is almost going to be a map of the campaign as you've taken it. So we can imagine the, the journey that he's been on as he has gone through... Uh, with his favorite enemies and uh, his natural explorer areas that he's picked up. And we'll choose spells along the way there. I mean, we've already filled in what we need to for our Aberrant Dragon Mark. So why don't we... We'll, we'll end character creation here with our slots that are, are... Well, they're slotted. And we can fill those in in part three as we also conceptualize what kind of an animal companion will he have. Um, so everyone, let's take five minutes... Howdy lips, uh, I will be back, and when we come back, um, then uh, we can look at commune with nature, and we'll, uh, we'll help you out there before, well, I don't know, whatever else happens tonight.